While on holiday in Cornwall, my friend Abel took a whole raft of excellent photographs. As he sat with me at the stern of the boat, he took these four quick snapshots. I'm combining them here in an attempt to illustrate the potential of vision space for simulation, involving wide open spaces and to further research into the structure of phenomenal field or experiential vision. The observer is encouraged to compile vital aspects of experiential reality that optical projection alone either can't convey or attempts to convey in ways that are actually unnaturalistic. By unnaturalistic, I mean that the techniques don't actually occur within the phenomenon of vision, so amount to artificial visual engineering. Ultimately, I think we are shining a light on the difference between virtual reality and experiential reality, in the same way that Jan Kundrink places a very different emphasis on the words picture and image. There's a host of presentations explaining the fundamentals of vision space that attempts to model visual awareness, and they're listed at the end. For those that have seen some of these, you might like to skip forward two minutes. So briefly then, vision space is a new form of illusionary space based on perceptual structure as opposed to the structure of optics and central perspective. We generate the phenomenon of vision as biological systems, and as a result, vision is almost entirely non-photographically rendered. There's no projection going on. The fundamentals of vision space propose that entirely different data formations and processing systems are in play within the dorsal and ventral streams. These systems, with their individual takes on reality, play out separately in central and peripheral vision. The dorsal stream delivering an implicit form of spatial awareness that's presented directly within the data structure, so no need for occlusion or perspective-related considerations to gain spatial orientation awareness. Here the optical structure blur is replaced by disorder. There is no depth of field in peripheral vision. The ventral stream presenting in central vision provides the more familiar system associated with contemplation of objective form. This is both detailed and explicit in nature. We are once again going to concentrate on issues relating to implicit field in this presentation. But before we do that, it's worth noting how vision space breaks with other conventions of picture space and optical projection. Firstly, vision space has no use for the notional picture frame. Here we can see that the canvas and its orientation with respect to the wall is irrelevant. While the selected fixations are formed safely within the borders of each canvas, I don't acknowledge the orientation of the canvas with respect to what's being depicted. This situation is in part helped by the photographer, of course, and the gentle way the boat is swaying in the water. Similarly, the phenomenon of vision isn't framed by straight edges. The canvas edge is irrelevant here in determining where the perimeter of the depiction falls. The studio isn't high enough to hang the painting properly, but if I could, only the panel with the bird would be hung flat to the wall. The picture frame is also directly associated with concepts like depth cue. Space starting with the frame and picture plane with the illusion of depth provided by perspective and size constancy, for example. Vision space identifies that we don't rely on this approach for our primary form of spatial awareness. It would be too slow and computational heavy, for one thing. The implicit form of spatial awareness in peripheral vision comes courtesy of proximity cues. We establish a radial field structure set out in X, Y and Z dimensions from fixation. This spatial referencing system extends in all directions, incorporating us, the perceiver. We aren't separated out from what was being viewed. We aren't merely observers of the world. We are factored into it because we interface with it. While it's easy enough for an artist to suggest disorder through the texture of the canvas and brush marks on a two-dimensional plane, a new approach is required to then control this into a 3D expression of space. I think we could perhaps also start to make linkages between the overlapping receptive fields of neurons and the discrete marks being made here to articulate the spatial field accumulating and updating over time. Within the field there aren't any edges or lines being designated, the primary function of peripheral vision being to indicate spatial relationships on a local basis that then build into holistic appreciation of the entire space. There are perhaps linkages here between the system proposed by Jeff Hawkins for memory processing and known as hierarchical temporal memory. Implied in terms of vision, we could see that receptive fields are processing these spatial values. Artists have learned to involve the beholder in forming deductions about line and edge from the artwork. 
is the beholder that completes the perception, discovering and manifesting the lines and edges themselves. Lines and edges are not decoded from a picture on the retina to be processed into vision as a form of representation. There are no lines and edges until we compile them from the near chaos of baseline data formations emanating from optic flow. Such considerations are positioned at the end of a one-way diagnostic process of Q development and are not established by a transference process. Vision space theory indicates that there is a universal basis for sensory perception, a perceptual structure into which and in terms of which we make sense of the world fed by our sensory systems. Vision occurs to us and we see the world in relation to ourselves. This perceptual structure is aware awaiting sensory input as a spider sits in its web. As the philosopher Heidegger proposed, we are waiting upon, not waiting for. So we can envisage a form of all possibilities field, primed and awaiting input. The input determining values within discrete regions. Each value having no real objective meaning without association with other close neighbours, with that grouping being determined in relation to another grouping all building into an holistic awareness across the field. The summation of all this activity being seen in relation to the all possibilities field forming the basis of perceptual structure. Now I need you to afford me some leeway here. While a vision space painting starts with the all possibilities field, the size of the random dots depicted here is many times bigger than that occurring within the phenomenon. If you take one panel and then multiply that by a factor of 16, you can see that even then the grain is too coarse. Given my tool set, amounting to just a few brushes, I am able to articulate the underlying system, but not on a scale commensurate with the subtleties of experiential vision. So, top left we see a bird in the sky. The sky is not a surface, and so can't be assigned a disorder value. What cloud there is, is thin and wispy, and a long way from the fixation. The neurons can't determine a de facto spatial pattern from that input, so none is recorded. Sky is rendered from appropriately coloured random firing of the all possible values. The bird held in fixation is rendered according to the processes relating to the ventral stream and central vision. If we then move to the top right panel, we can see that we now have the sails and mast to depict, and these provide spatial definition. The fixation at the masthead, so the sail descends towards us and bellies as the disorder values increase accordingly. This rendering provides the spatial cues missing in the photograph but also helps to locate the viewer with respect to the area of interest. These marks are not depth cues, they're providing proximity cues that then sit within the sky's indeterminate condition. The result is compelling in the flesh, and many years ago I manually rendered these photographs to try and induce a feeling of vertigo. The lower right-hand panel fixation is located on the forestay. The intention is that the overall impression will be one of either a board or one of feeling able to board the boat. As you look at the force day, the space of everything in peripheral vision is set out in space through the spatial values indicated by the size of brush mark. Spatial awareness is implicit. Finally we move to the lower left panel with fixation on the shoreline. I had to think about this one and it's led to a new insight that I think is worth sharing. Okay, so once we're on the fixation point, it's possible to get a good sense of where the boat is, where the boom is with the sail, and how the boom and sail get closer to us as they exit right. The horse, or ropes from the end of the boom to the boat, help with the articulation of the spatial triangulation through Z depth. But it's the data formation and the underlying geometry of the field used to present the sea that I want to draw to your attention. At first glance it looks a bit nondescript and essentially comparable with that in other paintings. Paintings that contain a local fixation with adjacent objects can easily comply with a straightforward radial depiction of the field structure. I adapt a strategy using flat brush marks increasing in size as we move away in three dimensions from the fixation. These in turn giving way to dots that then incrementally increase in size with distance. The green marks in the far distance relate to trees outside the studio. You can see that these are large marks that are themselves broken up into smaller marks. It's rendering this texture within a texture that I have trouble with. Further outwards from fixation, we have the indeterminate all possibilities rendition for the sky. Now what happens in this painting is different, even though it's still essentially the same system. If we plot the horizon in nominal units, say kilometres, 
we can draw these out to a notional distance, say 3 kilometres in each direction. Our position in the boat is, say, 0.5 kilometres out from the shore. So we can immediately see that the field is not going to be spherical. It's going to be essentially a cone dragged out in the y-axis. However, this is not the end of the story, as we are not observers of the system. We are part of the system, embedded within it. Diagrammatically, we may form the sharp end of the cone, but in experiential terms, we should draw a fishtail-like scenario. In three dimensions, with experiential foreshortening, the system presents the open-ended tube-like structure, and it's this that dictates the size of brush mark in the painting over the sea. Where the boat is contained within the thickness of the sharp end of the cone, so still referencing Z depth by step-by-step -step incremental changes in the size of brush mark, the sea is, however, defined by the edges of the cone structure, ensuring that the fall-off to the larger size brush marks becomes significantly accelerated. Finally, I spotted an error of perception within the painting. My first reaction was predictably rats. I should have concentrated more when plotting this thing out. It is, however, actually a perfect illustration of the types of errors that we are prone to make as we attempt to orientate ourselves within picture space. So in which direction is the boom actually pointing? When I plotted the drawing out and populated the painting with vision space spatial references, I assumed that the boom was passing close to the head of the seated figure. In the painting this is quite unambiguous for me and I can't see it any other way. However, closer investigation of the photograph establishes that the boom is in fact much further back and out across the boat and into the sea. To deduce this, you have to do a lot of looking around the photo. The spatial coordinates have to be built up through multiple assessments made by central vision. We're having to use an explicit process to determine what should be implicitly available to us. The implicit spatial function is simply absent in the photograph, and it's led to the perceptual mistake. Alternatively, you could of course look at the jib or foresail and deduce that I would of course have set out both sails correctly in the first place. So what, I hear you say. In terms of medical imaging and other instrumentation involving remote orientation tasks, ambiguities and mistakes are likely to have very significant implications. We need perceptually structured information display systems.